Okay, hello, my name is Nick Legler, and I'm a fisheries biologist with the Wisconsin DNR in Sturgeon Bay. And today I'd like to present a brief update for the Stillmounted Working Group. In previous years, I believe that Scott Hansen and Randy Claremont presented the Stillmounted Working Group updates. I am a new, relatively new fisheries biologist. I started at my current position with the Wisconsin DNR about 11 months ago and I was hired primarily to work with Chinook Salmon and Steelhead Management for Lake Michigan. So I work very closely with Scott Hansen, but since I've been hired, Scott Hansen is now focusing a lot more on uh, whitefish and smallmouth bass in Lake Michigan, and he's been transitioning some of his salmon responsibilities over to me. So as a result, I'm here giving this presentation today instead of Scott. So the information that I'm, I'm going to present a lot of different information today that was provided to me by a number of different biologists and researchers from throughout Lake Michigan. So right off the bat, I would just like to acknowledge both the Salmonid Working Group and a number of, of different people that provided information to me for this presentation today. So my the primary focus of my presentation today is going to be on the Chinook Salmon Red Flags Analysis. Specifically, I'll talk a little bit about the, the history and the methods that are used for the Red Flags Analysis. And then I'll mostly talk about the trends in the, the data that's used in the Red Flags variables. Um, most importantly, I have some of the more recent data from 2012 that I will show everybody and how that compares to the past data. And then I'll talk a little bit about some potential and future changes to the Chinook Salmon Red Flags Analysis. And then lastly, I'll provide a very quick update on 2013 stocking reductions for Chinook Salmon and also the Great Lakes Mass Marking Program. So the, the Red Flags Chinook Salmon Analysis was initially developed in 1997. I believe it was developed by Jory Jonas and Rob Elliott. And it's initial intent was to provide a, a basically a public presentation so that information on Chinook salmon could be easily uh, presented to the public. And since then, the red flags analysis has kind of expanded somewhat. There are a number of different variables and indicators that have been added to the red flags analysis. The primary purpose of the red flags is still the same. Uh, its, its main purpose is to monitor Chinook salmon and alewife abundance. Uh, lake-wide throughout Lake Michigan, and it is used as one of the primary tools of the Stillmounted Working Group to evaluate Chinook salmon and alewife populations. So this is a list of the primary indicators that are used in the Chinook salmon red flags analysis, and each of these indicators were chosen uh, to provide information on Chinook salmon abundance lake-wide, recruitment of Chinook salmon throughout Lake Michigan, <coughs> growth of Chinook salmon, prey and forage biomass, and then also there's a couple uh, variables that were chosen to evaluate ecosystem health within Lake Michigan. Regarding the methods and how the red flags work, um, looking at the, the trends of the data, we calculate the 20th and 80th percentiles, and if any individual data point from the recent year falls outside of these percentiles, that's an indicator that something bad is going on, that there's potentially concern in Lake Michigan and a, a basically a red flag goes off. This is the level one red flags analysis. There's also a level two. Uh, level two is designed more so to evaluate trends, uh, basically a trend that's deviating from um, the historical data set. And for the level two, we use 40th and 60th percentiles. And if three of the data points within the last five years fall outside these percentiles, then a red flag goes off. So in 2010, we calculated all the different red flags variables, and you can see that a number of different red flags went, up, went off. Each of those red dots indicates a red flag for both level one and level two. And Theoretically, the way the red flags analysis works is that if 50% of the red flags in either one of these levels goes off, then the Somonid Working Group would make a recommendation to the Lake Committee to either evaluate the situation farther or to make a change in 
uh, Chinook salmon stocking practices to try to counteract whatever's going on here. So for my presentation today, I'm going to focus on showing you the trends in the data, which includes the recent 2012 data. Um, for the information that I'm going to present, I did not calculate the percentiles. I'm, I'm simply going to show you the trends in the data. And unfortunately, all the data for these primary indicators currently is not available. So the, the four here highlighted in blue, um, I'm still waiting to, to receive that information for various reasons. It's just not, not available at this point. So first, I will focus on the Chinook abundance indicators. And the first graph that I'm going to show is the Chinook fishery catch rate. Uh, these abundance indicators are calculated only using data from Michigan DNR. And this is the catch rate for the state of Michigan charter fisheries. On the y-axis, we have the number of fish caught per hour. And then for each of the data sets that I'm going to show you, on the x-axis, it's a time series from 1985 up until 2012. And for the abundance, or for the, for the catch rate, you can see that the catch rates were very low in the late 80s, early 90s, likely due to um, bacterial kidney disease and, and different die-offs of the fish. However, in recent years, catch rates have been very high. And in 2012 specifically, the catch rate was 0 .309 um, Chinooks per hour, which is actually the highest catch rate that we've seen in the entire time series. Now you may look at this as an angler or even as a fisheries manager and say, high catch rates, this is great. Um, and to some extent it is good, however, this is also an indicator that the Chinook salmon abundance is extremely high right now. And when we compare this to some of the things that we're seeing with forage abundance and growth rates, um, this is an indicator that there's basically too many Chinook salmon out in the system. So the second indicator for abundance is angler success. And angler success is measured by um, the percent of the anglers that are catching greater than three Chinook salmon per day. And the trend that we see is very similar to the previous one. Um, it went down, came back up. Um, it did dip back down again in recent years. However, in 2012, 27% of the anglers were catching greater than three Chinook salmon per day. And that's the third highest value in this entire time series. And then the last indicator for Chinook salmon abundance is return to the weirs. And again, this is the total number of fish returning to state of Michigan weirs. And for 2012, the value was about 23,000, uh, which is kind of average, I guess you could say. So the next set of indicators that I want to show is the Chinook recruitment indicators. This is the percent wild for age one Chinook. And most recently in 2010, the percentage wild was 63 to 65% of the fish out in the lake that are wild. Now, in previous years, these estimates were conducted uh, basically using the OTC marking techniques. But in recent years, we're now able to use the, the coded wire tags to calculate uh, the percentage of the wild fish. This is a slide that was provided to me by Chuck Bronte. And both Chuck and Nancy Nate uh, recently calculated the total percentage of wild fish out in Lake Michigan using the coded wire tags. So this is the OTC estimates in recent years and then this is the new coded wire tag estimate for 2011. So it's kind of neat. We have basically two different methods that we've used to calculate this and you can see that um, the, the result was similar. Another indicator for Chinook Salmon abundance is Chinook's, Chinook smolt abundance. So this is the total number of smolts that were stocked into the lake plus the estimated wild production. And in 2011, the, es the estimate was about 8 million smolts. And again, about half of those smolts were uh, wild and about half of them were stocked. For age one Chinook abundance, I unfortunately do not have this data available yet for 2012, but I threw up the chart just to show you what the, the trends have looked like in the past. 
Um, I'm not too familiar with how this number is calculated, but I believe that this abundance is calculated using a re regression model that uses um, alewife abundance to predict age one Chinook abundance. So the next set of indicators that I want to look at is Chinook growth rates. And one of those indicators is the Chinook weight at age two, calculated from the Michigan DNR Creel. Uh, and again, this is one of the data sets that I did not have available for 2012. It should be available probably in about a month or so. But this is what the historic data has looked like. We also use Chinook weight at age three from Strawberry Creek. Uh, this is from the, the Wisconsin DNR's uh, Strawberry Creek Weir in Sturgeon Bay. And it's the weight, average weight of an age three female Chinook salmon. And in 2012, the average weight was about 5,400 grams, which was the second lowest weight in history. We also look at the standard weight of a 30 inch Chinook at Strawberry Creek. And you can see that in 2012, the standard weight was about uh, 3,900 grams. And just for clarification, this is how we calculated the standard weight. This is just a XY scatter plot of the weight of all the fish that we, that we process at the Strawberry Creek Weir and the length. And again, the standard weight is about 3,900 grams. So why do we use Strawberry Creek? Um, I believe one of the main reasons why Strawberry Creek is used as in this indicator is that it, there's a very historic data set available. Strawberry Creek is the primary egg collection facility for the Wisconsin DNR. In a good year, we'll collect 100% of our salmon eggs from Stra the Strawberry Creek facility. It's been in operation since, I believe, the 70s, so we have a very long, good data set. And the growth of, or the size of a Chinook salmon is a very good indicator of predator-prey balance, how much food that, that Chinook is eating. Um, unfortunately, as we move forward, I think there are some things that we should consider uh, regarding how we use this, this indicator, specifically due to the low water levels that Lake Michigan is facing right now and the effects that those low water levels have on the ability of those fish to return to Strawberry Creek. And this year in 2012 was kind of, I guess, an extreme situation at Strawberry Creek. It was from, from the technicians that I've talked to that have been around for a while, they said this is, it's probably the lowest water they've ever seen at Strawberry Creek. Um, this is a picture of Strawberry Creek at the mouth, and I guess two things should probably jump out at you when you see this. One, Strawberry Creek isn't a very big stream. You know, when I moved to Sturgeon Bay 11 months ago, I was actually pretty surprised when I saw how small the creek was, especially considering that it's the primary Chinook salmon egg collection facility for the entire state of Wisconsin. So it's a small stream, and as you can see, water levels were very low uh, this year in 2012. And as a result, um, these Chinook salmon did have a hard time getting up into the stream and to the, the weir. It's just probably about a mile or two from the mouth of the river up to Strawberry Creek, the, the Strawberry Creek weir. We do have a couple of different methods that we can use at Strawberry Creek to try to help these fish to get up. One, we have a, a big industrial diesel pump. This pump runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week when we're doing our spawning operations. It pumps water. Um, again, about a mile upstream, and it discharges, discharges that water into the stream upstream of the Strawberry Creek Weir. So to, by doing this, we're basically artificially supp supplementing the water in the stream to try to create a channel for those fish to get up. Um, this year, even with the pump, um, we still, the fish still struggled to get up. We, we actually had to do an emergency dredging operation where we had to take an excavator and dredge out at the mouth of the river to try to create a channel for the Chinook salmon to get up into the, into the facility. And as you can see, we did four egg collections at Strawberry Creek this past fall. All of them occurred in April. And the numbers of Chinook salmon that we processed on each of these days was, was very small. Up until our last harvest, we had 1,500 Chinook salmon. Well, all throughout this period here, we were running the pump, we did the dredging, the fish still weren't getting up. The weekend prior to October 22nd, it pretty much rained nonstop for two days. 
And as a result, the, week, the next week those fish responded and they came up into the, into the street. Now one of the things, you know, the, the weight of an H3 Chinook salmon at Strawberry Creek not only is used in the red flags analysis, but it's also been identified as one of the uh, key, feedback, a key feedback mechanism for the, the recent stocking reductions. So if the weight of Strawberry Creek or the weight of an H3 Chinook at Strawberry Creek drops below a certain value, we're potentially going to recommend more stocking reductions in Lake Michigan. And some of the anglers have seen this and said, well, legitimately, if, if the fish aren't getting up there, maybe just the smaller fish are returning, and that's going to affect your, your data and your analysis. So I think that's something that we should definitely consider as we move forward. So the next indicator that I want to talk about is the prey abundance. So this is the total alewife biomass based on the hydroacoustic survey. And the 2012 value was 23.95 kilotons. That's the total estimate of alewives throughout Lake Michigan. And this value for 2012 was the third lowest in the, the data series. And then secondly is the alewife biomass based on the bottom trawl. Um, the acoustic survey is a gear type that basically targets all sizes of alewives. The bottom trawl is more selective for larger alewives. So you see a lower estimate, but again, the 2012 value was very low. It's the second lowest in the historical data set. And then the last indicator that's used for growth is the length, the mean length of a coho jack returning to the Michigan DNR weir. And again, unfortunately, I don't have the recent data available. Um, I actually did, I did receive this data, but the data point was like way up here, which to me just, didn't make sense, so I didn't present it here. I'm going to kind of follow up with the person that I received that information from and, and see what if that was maybe an error in the data. And then the last set of indicators that's used in the red flags analysis is fish health and ecosystem integrity. And this includes visual signs of disease at the weirs. Again, this is only for Michigan DNR weirs. And in the 80s and 90s, we saw a lot of disease, again, most likely due to BKD. In recent years, the Chinook salmon are very healthy. In 2012, uh, only 33 of over close to 3,000 fish actually had visual signs of disease. Um, I think this is going to be an important in indicator to keep a close eye on, especially under the current situations in Lake Michigan where forage abundance is low and growth rates are low. With that stress, that nutritional stress on those fish, you may expect to see greater incidences of disease uh, in the near future. So that's something we should definitely keep an eye on. And then we look at lake trout egg thiamine. Um, this is pretty straightforward, the 2012 value. Uh, basically anything below this four line is considered potentially sub-lethal. So we are above that currently. And then this is just a, a farther breakdown of that egg thiamine uh, data. It shows the total numbers of fish that were sampled for thiamine, uh, the thiamine values, standard deviations, and then the percentages of the fish sampled that were either below, above or below that, that lethal level. And then you can see there's a number of different sampling locations that were, that were evaluated. And then the last indicator that's used in this uh, part of the red flags analysis is the composition of lake-wide harvest. And again, this 2012 data is not available yet, but this is what the historic data looked like. So in, in general, I would say the red flags analysis has been a very successful and effective method at evaluating Chinook salmon and alewife populations in Lake Michigan. The analysis has been used to guide a number of different stocking reductions for Lake Michigan, I believe in 1999, 2006, and most recently for 2013. Um, so it works, it's a, it's a fairly simple method to explain and to use at public meetings to, to demonstrate to the public what's going on in Lake Michigan. However, there are some things that we may want to consider to improve the red flags analysis in the future. And Rick Clark specifically recently wrote a very detailed uh, report and he recommended a few specific things that we could potentially think about for for changing the red flags analysis 
And I'm just going to quickly run through what some of his major recommendations were. They were to clarify the objectives for the red flags analysis, to revise the list of primary indicators used in the analysis, to revise the triggering mechanism, to develop more explicit metrics to evaluate the success of our stocking policies, and then lastly, to add a projection model to predict a few years ahead. And again, Rick's paper that he wrote describes these in very much detail. Uh, I'm just going to provide a very uh, quick, a couple quick points on these different objectives. Regarding the indicators, the red flags analysis has kind of expanded over the years. And it, it uses a, a whole lot of different indicators. And Rick Clark suggested that we might want to think about whittling that list of indicators down and focusing on a few specific indicators that really get at telling us what is the Chinook salmon abundance and what is their primary prey, the alewife, what is their condition in abundance. And this, I guess, has a couple potential advantages if we were to whittle it down. One, it could make it easier to interpret and evaluate the red flags analysis. And also, it could provide a smaller list of, of data needs that the eight different agencies can focus on collecting. Uh, which may be helpful, especially as a lot of the agencies have you know, staffing shortages and things like that. His, another one of his recommendations was to revise the triggering mechanism. The current triggering rec mechanism relies on the percentiles. Um, and what Rick is suggesting is that instead of using percentiles, we look at the data, we look at data from Lake Huron, we look at the historic trends in the data, and we use that, the literature, and we come up with what we think is a reasonable upper limit and lower limit, not based on the, the percentiles. And then he also suggested that we, we set a more objective target. Um, conditions in Lake Michigan are constantly changing. So when you're using the percentiles, you know, the percentile may not be a, a reasonable target if, if situations have changed significantly in the lake. So by setting specific targets, uh, we can change those targets as conditions in the lake change, and this may may provide a more objective and reasonable approach for the analysis. Rick also suggested that we incorporate a projection model into the analysis. Um, when the red flags go off, they're an indicator that something bad is going on in Lake Michigan right now. And potentially, it could be too late. You know, by the time we see all those flags going off, maybe it's too late for us to do anything. So if we did more of a projection model, that might provide us uh, more of a um, more time to react to what's going on out in the lake. So again, Rick put together a very comprehensive report on all these different recommendations. Uh, about two weeks ago, uh, myself and a number of other biologists from around Lake Michigan met in Charlevoix, and we discussed all these different um, potential changes to the red flags analysis. Um, the, this workshop, this first workshop, specifically focused on the Chinook salmon component of the red flags. On April 22nd, there's going to be a second workshop that's going to focus on evaluating the alewife component of the red flags analysis. After this workshop is done, uh, Rick's going to put together a final report. He's going to make the recommendations. I believe his report is going to go to the Samanid Working Group, and then from there, uh, the Samanid Working Group may make change recommendations to the Lake Committee on how we should go forward with using the, the red flags analysis in the future. So just very quickly, I have one slide to summarize uh, the stocking reductions. Uh, I'm sure you're all very well aware that in 2013 we're going to be implementing stocking reductions for Chinook salmon throughout the lake. Uh, the stocking is going to be reduced by 50 percent, and this slide just shows um, how that, those reductions are split up. So the blue value is the numbers of Chinook that were stocked in 2012 by each of the states. And then the, the red bars here are the proposed stocking for 2013. And again, collectively, it was about a 50% cut. And then the Somatid Working Group is, is very involved with uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service and another number of other collaborators on the Great Lakes Mass Marking Program. So I just wanted to provide a single kind of snapshot summary of some of the recent results for the Great Lakes Mass Marking Program. Um, this 
slide was provided to me by Chuck Bronte, and it, it basically shows the returns uh, for each of the different states and the locations where those fish were stocked. So the take home message is anglers from every state are catching fish that were stocked by, by all the different agencies as well as from Lake Huron. And I think this is just kind of a snapshot of what's to come with the Great Lakes Mass Marketing Program. Um, it's, it's been real neat for me to be involved in this project and I think there's a lot of really neat things that we're going to learn uh, from this work. And uh, Chuck Bronte, I believe, is going to give a more detailed presentation uh, later on um, about this, this program. <coughs> so I guess that's all that I have. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Hey, we have time for questions.